This is the second portion of the memory lecture. The second portion was given on Tuesday, November 17th. And this is the section on forgetting and false memory construction. Forgetting can occur when someone experiences damage to their brain. Uh, this can come from brain disease. It can come from a trauma like a car accident. It can come from genetic disorder. But when a person experiences memory loss due to brain damage, uh, we call refer to this as amnesia. There are two primary types of amnesia. Uh, and it, what the different types refer to is when the amnesia was created or what parts of the memory uh, is forgotten. Anterograde amnesia is amnesia in which a person loses short-term memory loss after the initiating event, like a disease or a trauma. Um, a good example of this is if you've ever seen the movie 50 First Dates, uh, the woman in the movie cannot remember uh, anything that happened after a car accident. She lives each day and then she wakes up and her memory goes back to that car accident and nothing else. Retrograde amnesia is the opposite. And retrograde amnesia is when old memories are forgotten uh, before the event. So when a person forgets their name or forgets where they live or who they are based on the amnesia inducing event. But if a person experiences memory loss and they don't have brain damage, it's likely due to a failure in one of the three stages of memory. An encoding failure is when someone doesn't pay close enough attention. Uh, you may remember that if we don't pay attention uh, to our sensory memory, it is forgotten. So if someone pays, uh, doesn't pay close enough attention uh, and then can't remember the details as a result of that, that's due to a failure in the encoding stage. A failure in the storage stage of memory is when someone tries to cram too much information in their brain. What you see here is a picture of uh, the famous forgetting curve developed by Hermann Ebbinghaus. What he did is he had his participants memorize a series of syllables and then tested uh, the memory of them at various periods rating from uh, 20 minutes to 30 days. What he found is that uh, within uh, nine hours, uh, close to 65% uh, of all the information was lost because the participants didn't have time or didn't have the ability to process all of that information. And so therefore not all of it made it into their long-term memory. If it's a failure on the retrieval side of things, it's most likely due to uh, what we see as interference. So interference basically is this idea that uh, we can mix up things and so if we forget one thing because we're mixing it up with something similar, that's what we would call interference. There are two types of interference, proactive and retroactive interference. With proactive interference, uh, you forget kind of the newer information that you've studied or that you've tried to remember because you're mixing up with older information. Say, for example, you were trying to remember uh, a new address, but all you could think about was your old address after you've moved. Uh, that would be proactive interference. Retroactive interference is when we forget the old information because we mix it up with something newer. So if, for example, you've gotten a new phone number and you've told everybody that new phone number, and then all of a sudden someone says, what was your old phone number again? And you can't remember because all you can think about is your new phone number. Uh, that's what we would call retroactive interference. Now, these are easily mixed up and uh, same with uh, anterograde and retrograde amnesia. And so here's a great way to remember it. With anything that is retro is old, if you think about the term retro. And so because of that, retroactive interference is when old information is forgotten uh, because it's being mixed up with newer ones. And with retrograde amnesia, it's old information is being forgotten before the amnesia inducing event. Now, sometimes we can forget due to very strong emotional reactions. Uh, the idea of motivated forgetting uh, is a concept that basically tells us that with a strong enough emotional response, specific details of events can be lost. And I'll give you an example from my own life. When I was 14 years old, I was caught stealing. 
Now, I don't remember exactly where I was stealing. I can remember the storefront. I don't remember where I was stealing or what I was stealing. I do remember the event of how I was caught, but I don't remember some of the specifics behind it because of the intense fear emotions that I experienced uh, before, during, and after. Repression is something that famed psychologist Sigmund Freud believed was uh, very possible. He believed that much of our uh, memories that really were traumatic to us, especially from childhood, uh, were repressed into our unconscious mind. And he believed that sometimes our unconscious mind manifested itself and caused us to shut down those memories. Now, we know today that that is extremely rare and not nearly as common as he once thought. Uh, memory repression today we know is probably doesn't occur almost at all. There are a few small cases, but mo in most cases, it's the idea that a person actually who experiences trauma will probably replay the events over in their head, creating post-traumatic stress disorder. When we talk about false memory construction, the big one that we have to think about is the misinformation effect. If you are fed leading information, uh, it can cause your recollection of the event uh, to be misconstrued. Uh, in the picture here, if someone is recollecting a car accident and the question is how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, uh, then a person may remember the cars literally being smashed, even though in the actual event it didn't occur. The imagination effect is something similar. Uh, with the imagination effect, our own imagination uh, can cause us to create uh, recollections of events that never occurred. Um, if someone is at a party and they're talking to someone that they really like, they may have this imagination that things are going really well. And when they recollect it later, they may exaggerate due to that focus on that imagination. Uh, and then if they ask the other person, then that other person might be like, well, I'm not so sure that that actually took place. Source amnesia can, uh, can create false memory construction when the source of that leading information uh, is proven to be false. Um, famed child psychologist Jean Piaget had an extremely vivid early memory that he was uh, kidnapped at the age of two. Um, and he had been, this had been corroborated and, and, and kind of backed up by, some of, by one of his family nurses. Uh, over the course of his childhood, he developed stronger and stronger and more intense memories of this event. Later on, when he was 13, the nurse admitted that for attention, she'd made the whole thing up. But this demonstrated how corroboration of someone close uh, being uh, could basically create this false memory in a person's mind. Deja vu is a feeling that we get when we feel like we've experienced something before, either previously in our life or maybe sometimes in a dream. But deja vu is actually just false memory construction. With deja vu, what's occurring is basically when we are in a certain environment that we've either been in before or dreamed about before, we recollect uh, that previous experience, but alter some of the details. Uh, we alter the details to fit the current moment uh, because that's what we're experiencing then. Basically, we can't remember those previous details uh, in of previous experiences or the dreams that we've had um, and yet to fill them in, our brain just takes examples from that similar environment. And so deja vu actually doesn't really occur. It's just more uh, a weird combination of false memory construction um, and uh, misinformation. So how do we improve our own memory? What do we do? Well, rehearsing repeatedly will help create the storage process that will put things into your long-term memory. Make the memory and the material meaningful. When you connect it to yourself, you have more relevance. Activate retrieval cues, so environmental cues or mental state cues. So this could be like getting good rest and or having a specific type of breakfast in the morning. Create mnemonic devices to allow us to chunk information together. Minimize interference, so really look at the key details and differences between things that are similar so that you don't mix them up. Sleep. 
if we don't sleep, our ability to remember is going to be very difficult. And finally, test yourself. Because when you test yourself, you're stimulating with the, yourself with the knowledge that you'd already developed before. And that is the end of the lecture.